So let me get this straight. There's this time where you're sitting in front of the, the U.S. Senate and you're trying to justify why it's okay for two people to be punching each other and hitting each other and these people have no concept of video games. And what I looked at by that time was a community of 200 million players that play RuneScape. So then you moved into uh, becoming the international president of Activision Blizzard. Well, Blizzard wasn't on board then, it was Activision. Probably your biggest moment was in Jagex, is that true? Probably the biggest moment was in Acclaim when it was the biggest company in the world and it had more combat. And, oh, uh, wow. Okay, so Rod, several websites have articles on you, and one of my favorites was from sponge.com, in which it says that you are one of the founding fathers of today's video game industry. And I thought that was such an epic compliment. You have been around in video games longer than most people. Right, since since 1981, in fact. And when I first started, uh, people dismissed video games. Today it's cool and it's interesting and it provides a career for someone, etc. Whereas back then, people wouldn't speak to me. It was considered to be a fad. When I did distribution through record labels, they, they didn't believe in it. And today, record labels are trying to get into video games and breaking artists and putting artists into video games. If you look at Fortnite, Roblox, you know, uh -huh. Travis Scott and things like that. So it's got, and of course now video games is bigger than mu uh, the music and TV combined. So uh, <laughs> You've been literally playing video games longer than I've been alive. That is... Yeah. That is look, wonderful. Look the age, you know, so, uh, <laughs> Tell me a little bit about your career. You started with Quicksilver, and that was in 1981. Uh, when did you move over to Acclaim? Or that was your second thing? No, no what, what happened after uh, we sold Quicksilver in 1984, Quicksilver was distributed um, around the world by CBS Records, which is now Sony Music. Oh, wow. And, and what did Quicksilver do again? It did, um, there was a game called Ant Attack, which was a big seller. It had a, another game called the Software Studio, which was musical interface software to allow up and coming musicians have something that was basically as simple as possible to create their own music at home. So I saw Ant Attack, the, the cover to it, and yeah. it looked like the most retro game uh, I could have ever imagined. And, and so games were obviously a lot different back then. I mean, Ant Attack, can you, can you describe a little bit of the, the gameplay of Ant Attack? Yeah, well, the big thing, there were a couple of things back then that were important. I mean, we were going from black and white home computers into color, which had all of 48K of memory. So, <laughs> if you, yeah, if you think about that, you had color issues and you had memory constraints when you designed the game. And the idea came up with, the, there's this amazing artist called Escher, E-S-C-H-E-R, who did these three dimensional, almost black and white, you know, images, etc. And so we used that as a base and we thought it would be great to have these marauding, massive size ants attacking uh, <laughs> uh, uh, and so forth. So, that's what we did within the constraints of what we can do. But, you know, in those days, sounds were a little more than beep, beep, beep. And as I say, <laughs> the, the, the color palette you could use was limited. So we created this environment to try and give it as much atmosphere as we could within a 3D environment, which was essentially a walled city. And, <laughs> uh, and, and you came under attack and hence ant attack. Yeah, and, uh, we had, so forth. we've come such a long way. So yeah, that was what did it. And uh, that got me going, I guess. And we did, it was pretty, you know, when people talk about disruption today, let me tell you, that was the first series because we were truly disruptive back in the day because it was a world that, that it didn't exist. It was opening yes. up. And, yes, uh, you were you were starting gaming. So Ant Attack was one of the, you know, the breaking technologies that was like, no, video games should be a thing. And, and like you said earlier, no one even believed you that it should even be a thing. It was a, you know, you were probably viewed as being quirky or having something that would never catch on. And yeah, that, you know, the, the couple of other interests things which come bring it back to today and design was I used to if you go back and find any early interview for me I used to talk about the enemy so as to speak was coin -op. and of course coin -op was by 
definition of the name, designed to drop coin, force you to spend as much money as possible. And so I would argue that we were selling games for 10 bucks, which would give you 12 hours of enjoyment to counter that. If you come on to free to play today, what it is in real terms is a modern day mo uh, model of coin drop because that's what we're doing in, you know, in real terms. Yeah. I mean, and also if you go out to Asia now, I mean, free to play microtransactions, all of the stuff that I talked about back in the day, which was dismissed in the States and said it was an Asian thing that would never happen in <laughs> the West. And of course it's, you know, the dominant uh, monetization model today. So mm. you have to be careful what you say. It comes yeah. to bite you. <laughs> it's, it's so true. Okay, so then you moved into uh, becoming the international president of Activision Blizzard? Well, Blizzard wasn't on board then. It was Activision. And then okay. I left Activision to head up the international division of Acclaim. Okay, so you were part of Activision before it was Activision Blizzard? Yeah. Okay, and then it was, you were the president of the international, that's such an epic title. <laughs> <laughs> well, international in those days was not a lot smaller than it is today. I mean, the market was divided up between the States, which was the biggest market, Europe, and Japan. Japan had about 30% of the market share in those days, and today, of course, it's a lot smaller. And that was really, the extent of what would be determined Asia, whereas today, China, Korea, Taiwan, Japan, everything out there is the biggest part of the world market today. Okay, well, we don't have to tell people it's smaller. That way, people just hear international president, and they think, whoa, this is the... Cra and they think Activision Blizzard, which is number three company in the world. It, it was still pretty big and pretty exciting, and it took me all over the world, and I learned every market, and I, every market was different. And if you ask me what I am, I'm just a student of the world market who's never grown up. Mm, wow, that's a that's a beautiful line right there. Yeah. So then probably your biggest moment was in Jagex, is that true? Probably the biggest moment was in Acclaim when it was the biggest company in the world and it had Mortal Kombat. And, oh, uh, wow. That was pretty big. And it was also at a time when the market was evolving to contemplate things like censorship and violence and age ratings in games, none of which existed up until that. Oh my goodness. Even just trying to think of the idea of yeah. that being a new issue of how to censor violence. And Mortal Kombat was probably pretty edgy in that regard. Very. I mean, you know, we were hauled up before the Senate. We had to explain oh. it. Um, and uh, and so forth. So and the, the the difference was part of the explanation was teaching people about video games because you were talking to people who had no comprehension about it, right? And uh, and so forth. Versus today, you know, it's grown up through generations, and everyone's got the knowledge, and you can do a lot more with it, and it's the biggest form of entertainment. But back then, it was never the case. It was solo. There was no global connectivity, so very different. So let me get this straight. There's this time where you're sitting in front of the, the US Senate and you're trying to explain Mortal Kombat, which they'd never even, they had no concept of. And you're trying to justify why it's okay for two people to be punching each other and hitting each other. And these people have no concept of video games. Is that? Yeah. <laughs> you're trying to explain the final statement in Mortal Kombat, which says, finish it. <laughs> and how it's a game where kids can understand fantasy versus reality and politicians couldn't. <laughs> this is such a mind boggling. I don't know if you have any pictures of that moment. I'm just picturing you trying to explain to a bunch of U.S. senators back in what? What is this? 1990? Yeah, in the early 90s. It wasn't just in the US, it was it was the same over here and uh, throughout Europe. I mean, we had to do the things like in Germany, because of the throwback um, to their history, it's a, et cetera, it's very, you know, guns and blood are not allowed, uh -huh. even to this day. So we had to put in, you know, instead of having red blood, we had to have a green liquid and things like that. We had to explain all of this to get round. We had to explain the fact that it was just a game, you know, yeah. and, uh, and kids have always, you know, they picked up twigs in woods and play, you know, cops and robbers and uh -huh. cowboys and Indians and things uh -huh. like this. But it took a lot of explaining. 
Wow, that is such a mind-boggling experience. Okay, and then you went into Jagex and, and you were talking about RuneScape. Yeah, well, one of the things that um, being in the US, it broadened my horizons uh, in lots of areas, um, obviously about the different things for different markets, but also working with because the claim was public with investment banking community and getting hold, raising money. And they put me into Jagex. And Jagex was a company that was originally a hobbyist company started in Cambridge, England by two students, where the game, if you want to talk about multiplayer, was on a LAN in a university dorm that just <laughs> grew out of control, right? And uh-huh. so to build the um, server networks and things like that was such there was no master plan in place. <laughs> it was something that evolved and the company was all, always playing catch up. That was started a very bright guy called Andrew Gower who had the vision to do all of that. I came in later when they would attracted investment from a, a US VC called Insight and, um, and the Rain and Spectrum. And what I looked at by that time was a community of 200 million players that played RuneScape. And um, the company was a very obvious company and it stayed like that. So it was how do you take something like RuneScape, which was to say it was Eurocentric, it was really UK centric and it was certainly English speaking centric. And it had about 4 million words at the time in the game, which made translation and localization challenging, although we got around that. So the idea was to take that community and which were hardcore RuneScape uh, mm-hmm. guys and give them alternatives. It was a a game that was built in Java, so Uh you were limited as a consequence of that, but it was a game that clearly you couldn't stop, as the Americans say, you have to change the tire on the car while it's running. (laughs) So we built a new engine in parallel to it to Uh migrate across. Wow. And that then gave us more platform capability. So we could go beyond PC if we wanted, we could go on to uh, consoles, we could go on to mobile devices. And uh, the language and the capability of the engine facilitated that. And so what I did was I brought in some interns who were data scientists to interrogate the community and particularly looking at lapsed gamers. And, you know, they'd grown up on it, they'd got jobs, they'd been distracted away from it. But how could I get them to go back into it? Well, we gave them a mobile version, right? And we connected it to the PC version and it it re-engaged them. We had a great um, community uh, and exchange going on. And then in turn, they brought their kids into it. And from that, we also created user-generated content. So we had a capability in the company of being able to produce that every two weeks. So it kept the community constantly engaged and interested. And a lot of it was of their own content. So it was proven out. And then, you know, we also expanded it globally. So it, it's, you know, it's transformational for the company, for the engagement in the game, the levels of interest in the game and the monetization platform forms in the game. Well, that was a perfect transition into my second question. And my second question for you is, you know, with you joining the Bone Project, it seems like you're switching over to mobile gaming. And and that is something that I've been kind of mentioning a lot on my channel is that it, it just feels like a lot of people, a lot of classic hardcore gamers, a lot of people, there's a negative connotation to mobile gaming, but the truth is, I think of when you were even trying to make gaming happen in the first place, people had a negative connotation of it, but in reality, there was this growing momentum for gaming that could not be suppressed. And it feels like the same thing is happening for mobile. The people in power in the gaming industry are like, no, mobile is the worst, and they're trying to suppress it. But in reality, it just keeps growing and it keeps getting bigger. Yeah, well, mobile today is the biggest platform in the world. If you're measuring it on the world stage, it's the biggest platform, right? And the second thing is what's happening in technology, which never stands still, where 5G, you are now starting to be able to accommodate more intense, immersive, and almost infinite gaming experiences that can go wherever. And if you're smart enough to tie this to a community, which has multi-platform capability in their own home, but are not necessarily themselves static in their own home, then a mobile device enables that. So you have access 
to gaming 24 7 if you really want on the move mm -hmm. and that's what it gives you now you've got the capability in the in the device and you've got total mobility and the real issue is making it compelling for your audience and mm -hmm. that's what it in a, it gives you an extension of something that sat on a desktop somewhere or sat, something that sat on the console somewhere and the other thing it is not easy as stadia has proved out to stream games around the world simultaneously mm -hmm. and, and so you can do a lot with a mobile device to make it compelling so actually people shouldn't fear it they shouldn't doubt it they should embrace it and see what it offers them see where they can take it and engage their own minds to explore it yeah it can can i add something there's yeah. really big guest i believe that uh, first, it's natural that that happens. I mean, my father's belief his music is the best. I believe my music is the best. A 15-year-old believes that his music is the best. It's a generational thing. But what we have seen with mobile gaming is that they are trying only to adapt what we already know to mobile. And there, there's when it breaks, because a game is made of mechanics, story, art, and technology. With a mobile phone, we need to explore new mechanics yeah. it's not the idea of having oh let's put a keyboard a digital keyboard on the phone so you have the same keyboard than a pc when you do that naturally it's better to play in a pc uh -huh. but a mobile phone has integrated technology that a p that a pc doesn't have mm -hmm. and will never have gps stuff for example three built-in cameras with depth with 5g that you can actually look at the planes and do a lot of stuff so i believe that as developers what we need to make is explore new mechanics and therefore with this new technology we can tell new stories we can do a lot of new things with that yeah, yeah you're right what it also gives you is a total creative landscape which you should not harness right otherwise games become formulaic and predictable which is exactly what gaming was never ever set up to be mm -hmm. right and so you've got this landscape which a mobile device where you attract creativity who can easily access it and add value to the content to do exactly what mark says and actually what it enables you to do is to cross generations so while you, you've got a, a community which may be a legacy community, you're attracting the up and coming community of what they want too. When I first came into games, I described gaming at the day as the equivalent of the silent movie stage of movies like Charlie Chaplin and things like that, right? And we moved on from there, right? And to today, you're creating cinematic experiences with all sorts of twists on it. You know, when it always happens, if you look at what's happening in movies, um, traditional publishers, Fox Warners, etc., having their lunch eaten by people like Netflix and Amazon these days, etc. And that's that's what mobile does. That's what he said. I agree with you guys. And actually, one of my favorite videos on this channel is a video that I it's called "Thousands of PC Gamers Are Switching Over to Mobile," which is kind of an edgy title because PC gamers are really upset about that. But it is true, and I show uh, in 10 minutes this very clear like migration of serious gamers switching over to mobile that leads me over to the third question really nicely and, and that is what are is your excitement specifically about the bone you know that this project really got me excited so i've been pushing it i've been saying hey this this is hope for mobile gaming this is a, a really promising idea um these guys are trying to innovate and try to create it free to play i mean it's all the things that we want to help the mobile gaming world uh what is your excitement about the game i mean you've touched on it i mean for me as i say i give you a background of where most of the games i see you've seen before it's not challenging it doesn't take you into new areas it doesn't do anything with what mark's developed it's a massive landscape that he's proposing right totally random embraces user-generated content that can hold no bounds it invites it encourages etc as you say free to play so it allows for all of that and it takes an old concept of superpowers into something that is that starts to become believable in superpowers. So you go into this immersive world, massively multiplayer online world that allows you to develop, create, and find, discover your own superpowers. And you know, that tailors to everyone's image. So it's one of the most creative, well thought through ideas that was refreshing and new that I felt would appeal to a brand new audience. Mm -hmm. And and that 
I mean, it stirred me. That was the biggest single thing about it, really, that it was it was new, it was different, and it was an example of what next and where you can continue to take gaming to. And then we got connected and it became even more interesting. When the game comes out, I've already set up to get at least six of these sets and my friends are really excited about it irl friends you know they're they're yeah. excited about basically doing tournaments and and playing yeah. and, and integrating this into our life we're pretty excited about making that happen so well, that was me and that's what it does and i mean just think about where you can take that to and it's a new horizon that's what he's developing here and he's going to take it all over the world now this is a good lead up to the the fourth question and that is you know with your vast amount of experience. You've seen this happen over and over again. You've seen games introduced into the world and people push it down. You've seen people introduce the the internet, the massive multiplayer. You've seen almost all these different stages of gaming and you've been part of that. When you see this new thing that Mark's going to be introducing into the world, are you saying, hey, Mark, we need to add this or we need to tweak this or we need to do this? What are some of the things that you foresee as being problems or what are the things that you're like, oh, we need to add blank so that this has its best chance for success? Well, I think, you know, my view on that is games evolve, right? And, uh, you know, they're living games. And so as long as Mark wants me to and feels that I've got a contribution to make as it goes through the development process, then I'm happy to add all of that. Now, there will be things, to your point, that you will adapt for local markets because the, the type of things that appeal in local markets, uh, there are very few games that have true global appeal. So you can adapt. That might just be a specific adventure you tailor make to a territory yes. to appeal. It may be with a character that really appeal. If you want to open up markets, you have to do things like that. But I would be initially support the team have enough work to be getting on with what they're gonna do. Plus they're gonna have scope from the community they start to develop who will not be slow in putting forward ideas and he's gonna be encouraging him and his team are gonna be encouraging that. And as he scales up his development capability, to absorb more and more of that. You know, hopefully I have a role to play in helping to steer, but it will be mainly making sure this goes out as broad as uh, as is possible and attracts as big an audience as is possible and appeals by having local content and particular packets of content that make the game really addictive. Yeah, that's great. I just had a thought that I wanted to throw out to both of you guys and hear y'all's opinion. You know, I'm personally really excited about the superpowers. You know, they, I've always loved the idea of magic. The imaginative aspects of magic is just, it makes you feel so powerful to wield. The, the imagination is so great. But one thing that I've thought about as I've been, you know, working with Mark and, you know, picturing this game come into existence is I think one of the things that will be very attractive about what Mark is setting up is the idea of the mini games. In our cultural moment, Battle Royale is is king yeah. still. It, it, it's like people keep thinking it's going to go down, but it just keeps going up. It just keeps being such a big deal. And so Mark and I have already been talking about how using his technology, adding the GPS aspects, I was even thinking the idea of, you know, you got the visor on. And then I was telling Mark, if you could have it to where you look back and you see the radiation zone closing in, and it might be hard to integrate that well with real life but to see that radiation zone coming and like oh no if i don't keep moving i'm going to start taking damage i think that's going to create some crazy publicity and you can still do it with superpowers i think some people are going to want guns but you can add that later the the bigger issue is just the fact that if you can create people will start being like oh have you heard about battle royale in real life oh yeah it's the game called you know the bone or or whatever uh you want to call it and that's what's going to kind of drive that because the idea of being able to have, I, I think Mark said you can have up to 20 players, having 20 people in real life get together and say, you know, you map out on Google Maps and you say, this is the the island, or this is the area, and yeah. it creates that radiation zone. I think that's just going to yeah. skyrocket. You see, you're now living proof of what I was talking about, about user-generated content being incorporated in the game. Um, and that's exactly what it was, and it is exciting. And uh, I mean, I just sat here listening to you and thinking that is a really cool idea. 
about that radiation concept and escaping it and doing everything like that. And, you know, you're right, there's time limits on it, there's all sorts of things. And think of that on a global scale. Think of that connected up around the world, etc., et and where you can take that. You know, yeah. so that is, that's a good idea. And that's what this game is designed to do. And that's what will be the experience. So um, there's In not fact, much else like it. So the technology we develop is kind of a toy, not a game. So imagine that we invented the ball. You can, we can decide as a group to kick the ball, uh, to throw the ball, uh, to hit it with something in the earth made of wood, of something of metal, and drop it into a little hole. So our job is to create the tools for anyone to set up the rules they want. Yeah. And so we're creating this and the idea of having mod that you as a user can only set some rules and say, so this is so unique that the idea is run, touch this point in a GPS and then run here. And if in the middle you get hit, hit it, well, then you will lose. I have no idea what's going to happen. But but yeah, this is the, the main combat mechanics are about superpowers, the toys are, yeah. but users should, we don't know wh which game mode is the best one. And we don't want to do, actually like impose it. That's in one part, but we also have the mobile experience only without the headset. And let me dive deep into that because it's exciting. So you live in San Antonio, Rob is in UK, right now I'm in Mexico City. How can we uh, create real mobile unique experiences about this? So think about it that I have the tools to create a quest in Mexico City and you can also create your own in San Antonio. So the game will work, but the experience will be completely different because the world is your stage. The, the idea of understanding that mobile should be mobile and you can get outside and leave different experience generated by users, It's going, to, but it's going to make a change. Because if I go in a vacation to San Antonio, probably I will find something that there's no way I can find here as a quest that you uh, first have built as a user. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <That's it. laughs> Okay, well, um, so my last question, um, and we've kind of already touched on this a lot, is just where do you see the gaming industry going? You've been there since the beginning. You're seeing its trajectory. Where, where do you see it going? I still think it's got a long way to go. And so I think episodic content in games as we know it today and the ability to stream around the world is tantamount to television and creating a series of television. And I think games end up at some point in time in their own TV shows and that becomes the medium which then interacts with whatever the device is. And so, I mean, you, you do get the true definition of interactivity that you can influence and it would make what's broadcast on the screen anywhere far more interesting. So I think it just gets bigger. I think more people pay attention to it. I think they do become platforms, right? A game can become a platform in its own right now. And whether that's to promote other things, whether it's to communicate, whether it's to just give you downtime to entertain yourself, etc. So for me, it's the biggest form of entertainment that's only going to uh, continue to grow and it's a truly global phenomenon that people are going to have to embrace. I can't think of a better way to end this video. That was great. I don't have as much experience, but I, I couldn't agree more. That's where we're going. I'm telling you, jump on for the ride. All right, <laughs> I'm, I'm in. <laughs>